If you care for your orchard, you'll enjoy its fruit. If you honor your boss, you will be honored. Just as water mirrors your face, so your face mirrors your heart. I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. God said, let the earth produce every kind of living thing, livestock, crawling things, and wildlife. And that's what happened. God made every kind of wildlife, every kind of livestock, and every kind of creature that crawls on the ground. God saw how good it was. Then God said, let us make humanity in our image to resemble us so that they may take charge of the fish of the sea the birds in the sky, the livestock, all of the earth, and all the crawling things on the earth. God saw everything that had been made. It was supremely good. Then God said to Noah and his children with him, I now establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you and every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Do you recycle? even when there's not recycled bins near you? There's the real question. Do you understand that recycling is a spiritual practice? Because it reflects our care for the earth and our relationship with all of creation. Now, if I am preaching to the choir today, perhaps there's some people watching online that recycle some of the time, or perhaps you know some coworkers or friends or family who only recycle convenient. Yeah, so if you are the choir, sing loudly, amen? And if you are not yet in the choir of recycling, then join us. In the video that we just watched, we heard that in the USA, four out of five water bottles are simply thrown away, ending up in landfills, streams, rivers, lakes, and the ocean, right? Week two of this series, we saw some things about the trash piles in the oceans. Remember that. Now, while the video that we just saw was one company's promotional video, and I want to acknowledge that because it was promoting their recycled products, I want to acknowledge that this video showed us that uh, recycled plastics can be recycled up to 5,000 times up to 5,000 times. So it's not just to make it the evil water bottle, hello, <laughs> but that the throwing it away is the bad thing. The video we had at the beginning of church today showed us that all kinds of products can be made from recycled plastic. We will recycle it. That's the question, right? If we will recycle. Now, I was asked this week by someone, wouldn't it be better if we simply reduced or eliminated our use of plastic rather than recycling it? And the question was whether or not, as a pastor, I was perhaps leading you down the wrong path, spiritually speaking. Well, I want to say, yes, we do need to reduce our uh, use of plastic, absolutely. And we could reduce our use of plastic by recycling the plastic we already have, number one, because we wouldn't have to make more, right? Okay? We can also... Uh, reduce and eliminate plastics that are not recyclable so that we focus on the ones that are, that we can reuse. So we can also refuse to buy those plastics that are not recyclable and commit ourselves to recycling the ones that are. Are you with me? It's not just plastic, but that's our symbol for today because that plastic does have a large trash impact on our world, but it is also our recycling things like glass, paper, cardboard, metals. Yes, and that can be a lot of, a lot of work. The question is, 
whether or not we're willing to do it. Many of you live in cities where there's pickup for recycling. And so we've done so much better because uh, you're able to do that and the city picks it up for you, right? And most of you don't even have to sort it. You are so spoiled. So spoiled. If you live outside of city limits, you have to sort it all yourself and you have to haul it. Willing to do that. But here's the deal. So many of you will do that recycling at home, and many of your family members and coworkers, as I said, may do that at home. But we get to work, and if there's not recyclable bins out there at the workplace, we toss it in the trash. Now, I can say that because I know that you good people here, because we don't have clearly marked recycling bins in the church, throw your plastic in the trash. Oops. We recycle, except, isn't that the truth? Except when there's not clearly marked bins available to us. Isn't that the truth? Some of us have the mentality, pack it in, pack it out. So some of us will take it back home with us. But not everybody. We know that pollution's a problem. But it's really easy to say, out of sight, out of mind. And so once we drop that plastic bottle or that glass bottle or that cardboard into a trash can, it's easy for us to forget about it. True or true? And we forget all of the issues that we've been talking about in this series. In this country and in this part of the country, we still have a big problem with littering. Isn't that true? Look around. Look at your lakes. Look at your rivers. Look at the sides of the highway. We have issues with littering. Shelly and I live out in the country, and I cannot believe how many people drive out in the country and just dump stuff. I mean, they have, sometimes you have to drive past the landfill, hello, to come dump it somewhere else. We have an issue with littering, and so much of what is littered is recyclable. That's what's amazing. So again, I'm going to ask, are we at a place where we recycle only when it's convenient and easy, or are we actually developing that place where we have respect for the earth and respect for God's creation and respect for our neighbors so we have a commitment to doing our best effort. Do you hear me, church? Are we committed to recycling everything that we can all the time? I, I'm, challenge, I'm challenging myself to, throughout this whole series to do better, to do more, to do better. I hope you are. Let me ask it this way. <laughs> if a stranger was to observe your lifestyle for a week in terms of what you do with your littering, your recycling, your reusing, your reducing, would they know you're a Christian? Would they see any difference between a person of faith and a person who didn't believe in God? Ooh, that one gets a little close, doesn't it? Because there's some people that don't believe in God who take much better care of the earth than people who believe that God gave us this earth. Isn't that true? And from Proverbs 27, if you care for your orchard, you'll enjoy its fruit. Hello? <laughs> it's like really basic. So if we take care of the earth, we'll enjoy the earth, right? Uh, I like that middle part, too. If you honor your boss, you'll be honored. That's just Proverbs always has these little short, pithy sentences. They're not always exactly connected, but their patterns of writing may be. And then that last one, just as water mirrors your face, so your face mirrors your heart. If your heart is connected to the divine presence, are you also connected to what holds God's heart? Can others see the heart of God in you? Throughout this series, I have been trying to communicate aspects of eco-theology, environmental theology, the connections between our spirituality and our environment for us in order to increase our awareness and our commitment to our God-given responsibility for the earth. I hope you've been hearing it, and I hope you've been realizing it. One of the resources for this sermon from Ellen Cohen Kiner, she writes, when we truly are called to earth care, there is usually a realignment of the relationship with our faith of origin. We begin to understand that the God of the cosmos is so much larger than the God of our creeds. We talked about that in week one. We may have read the Psalms about the hills dancing and the trees clapping as poetry, but not imagined ourselves praying along with all of creation. We may have read of the simple daily bread of the founders and ancestors and prophets of our traditions as quaint and distant customs, 
not as a mandate to satisfy our needs simply rather than overindulging. We may even be reading our ancient texts through our modern eyes, yet very few of us have green eyes. What color are your eyes? <laughs> we get very literal and look at the color of our eyes. But the question today is whether or not our eyes reflect the eyes of God. Are we seeing with green eyes? This morning, some of our young people came in and they were wearing their sunglasses and I commented on their cool shades and I was corrected by them that they were not shades, they were sunglasses. Okay, it used to be if you said sunglasses, you weren't cool, you had to say shades. But I had this metaphor here that this whole series is really about removing those shades or removing the lenses of our culture. Maybe those shades that have changed how we see things and getting back to our God-given green eyes, our earth-conscious eyesight, to see the whole world, the whole cosmos as God does. It is to see that we are in a relationship with the animals and with the plants. Is there an amen? That we are in a relationship with the land and the sea, as well as our neighbor. I can't say it enough for us to get it. Because we don't act like we really believe it. We have a, a conscious acknowledgement intellectually, but our behavior betrays that we have taken it from here and taken it down into the depths of our soul and connected it with our spirit. I assure you that when you've done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. Could the least of these also include the animals? How about the other living organisms of the earth? You see, to see green is to see through green eyes. It's to see life, growth, and productivity that provides for all of creation, not just me, but provides for all of creation in a sustainable, renewable, balanced way as God made it. Amen? It calls us then to recycle everything we can. We need to and can reduce our demand for things like bottled water by using reusable, refillable water bottles. Some of you say, I don't like the taste of my water. I like that spring water that I can buy. I don't like the taste of my city water. So I'm going to say, if we don't like the taste of our city water, which is many of us, have you ever called the water authority? Could we move to a step of action? Do you see what I'm saying? Call our city water authority and let them know it tastes bad. Let's do something about that rather than allow it to continue. We can take actions, Yes. We can have a consistent use of reusable, refillable cold drink cups and hot drink cups, and that would also reduce our trash, which we talked about in week two. We can use, uh, refuse to use cups and packaging that cannot be recycled or effectively reduced, uh, reused and also reduce our trash in that way. But it all begins, as this series did, from a place of respect, respect for all of creation, respect for God's handiwork, respect for God's intentions, and indeed that relationship with God. If we don't have that, I think we miss the whole cycle of the relationship. In Genesis 9, God said to Noah and to Noah's children who were with him, I now establish my covenant with you. We usually stop there. I establish my covenant with you and your descendants. Oh yeah, that's where we get included. But it goes on. And with every living creature with you. Who is with Noah? Who was in the ark? All the animals, right? I established my covenant with you, your descendants, and every living creature that was with you. The birds, the livestock, all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark, every living creature on the earth. That's who God's covenant is with. Have we made a covenant with God? God's covenant is with all of creation. Do we reflect that in our covenant with God? Or do we say, I just want a covenant with you and I don't care about anybody else that you're in relationship with? Do you understand what I'm saying? And in some ways, that whole movement of the, uh, well, uh, part of the, the 20th century, part of the 19th century and 20th century that really emphasized a privatized personal relationship with God caused us to disassociate from the rest of creation. Do you understand what I'm saying? It focused on my relationship with God as if nothing else mattered. And if I would use the Christian symbol of the cross, we focused on this part of the cross 
and missed this part of the cross. You hearing me, church? God's covenant is with it all. So if we're to follow God's way, if we're to follow the path of Jesus, then if we're to show respect for all that God has created, then we must also be in covenanted relationship with all that God has created, with every living thing, not just people. Amen? God sees the world through green eyes and sees the whole world as important. Do you? That's the question. God created a balanced uh, ecosystem. Is that true? Most of us studied the food chain in school. But think about that whole balanced ecosystem. God created it and looked at it and said, it's good. Or as Jim Carrey would say, it's good. But what do we see when we look at it? We, humanity, were given responsibility to care for the earth, right? To keep it green, to keep it alive, to work the earth. How have we done? How have we done? How's our scorecard? Not so good. Not so good, is it? So that's the past. What will we do? What are we doing today and what will we do? One week in this series, we talked about our stuff and our consumer culture that promotes more and more stuff. We talked about refusing the lie that we really needed all this stuff, amen, and that we needed to reduce not only our trash, but just how much stuff we consume and collect, right? Particularly in North America, we are a culture where you have your house and you have to have a larger house to store the stuff you don't use anyways, and then you rent a storage building to store the other stuff that you don't use. Amen. And then we say we can't afford it, but we have these like storage buildings with stuff we don't use. Am I speaking the truth? Hello. <laughs> How much stuff do we need, right? And this life cycle of so much stuff is just not green. It's just not green. So let me share with you. The extraction process, getting that raw material is the first step in creating stuff. So often hurts the poor, hurts the third world, hurts the planet. The production of the stuff continues to hurt the poor and, and uh, pollute the planet. In distribution, the stuff that it takes to make this stuff and the stuff itself when it gets distributed around the planet, moving around the globe, uses fuels and contributes to air pollution. And that final process of, of the stuff is selling the stuff and our consumption. Well, that's got problems too because planned obsolescence contributes to our consumption, right? Which results in the disposal problem. And the very structure of our consumptive society harms the poor of this world, domestic and foreign, and destroys ecosystems, including all the life within them, pollutes the air, the water, the land, and uses up valuable resources. The whole process of stuff. If you want to learn more about the life cycle of stuff, I encourage you to check out the story of stuff on YouTube. There's a thing called the Stuff Project, okay? And uh, there's a little short 20-minute video, but there's also three-minute videos, and you can check in on a lot of details about what's happening, particularly in American culture, because this is where we are, and this is where we have a contribution to make. Yes? Yes? Okay. So you could check it out. See, I'm trying to get us to understand that seeing with green eyes and realizing these issues is part of our spiritual covenanted responsibility. It is part of my spiritual covenanted responsibility. Would you say that with me? It's part of my spiritual covenanted responsibility. One more time. It's part of my spiritual covenanted responsibility. And part of that spiritual covenanted responsibility is to see both the problems and the possible solutions. It's not just to see the problems become overwhelmed and depressed. Amen? It isn't. It's to recognize that while we are a very small part of the whole, because I'm a tiny spot in the all of the cosmos, we, are, we have the choice, an opportunity to be a small part of the problem or a small part of the solution. Amen? We do not let our smallness in the, the scope of things stop us from acting justly. Is there an amen to that? At the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry here, he faced temptations in the wilderness, right? Well, we understand that we too are frequently tempted. Amen? In the context of this study, we are often tempted to turn away from God, to turn away from love and relationship with all things. We're tempted to take the easier way out. We're tempted to buy the lies that there's nothing we can do about pollution. <laughs> there's nothing we can do about trash, and there's nothing we can do about climate change. We are tempted 
to take care of our immediate needs and wants without thinking of the consequences or thinking beyond ourselves. Temptation, true? We're tempted to lead others into sin, into that greater separation between each other, greater separation with the land and with our Creator by encouraging others with our example and our words, tempting others to litter, to waste, to trash recyclables, to not practice whole earth, whole life stewardship. We are tempted to separate our spirituality from the physical world. And we have been tempted to forget that we do not own this world. <laughs> We've been tempted to believe that the land, the waters, the plants, animals of the earth are ours to do with what we want. And we are tempted to ignore our responsibility with the earth, our stewardship, instead trusting that God will provide. Now, I say it with that kind of tone because we do trust that God will provide, right? But there's a way in which we don't behave in accordance with God's direction for us, and we just trust God to keep fixing it for us. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's, it's that I forget that God's asked me to do something, and I just blindly trust that God will fix it in God's good time. I forget my partnership, my covenanted responsibility with God, my role as co-creator with God in the here and now. And I pray God will just take care of it eventually. Well, as Methodist uh, Bishop Sally Dyke wrote, metaphorically speaking, many of us have succumbed to the temptation of throwing ourselves off the highest pinnacle, expecting that God will save us, instead of facing the controversy that might arise if we were to point out the connection between our faith and a more sustainable lifestyle for ourselves, the nation, and the world. Corporately, We have to value the earth as God's good creation instead of ravaging it to meet our insatiable needs and longings. Corporately, we must stop things like mindlessly lopping off the tops of mountains to strip mine for coal or casually dumping toxins into water. Individually, we must respect, reduce, refuse, reuse, and recycle. We must see the world through green eyes, eyes of God, and we must see the harsh realities, the truth of things, and experience the disappointment and the pain as God does to feel the heartbreak of creation and the creator so that it moves us to step up our responsibility for the whole earth as well as for each other. Mike Bennett wrote this article, The Biblical Call to Environmental Stewardship, and he said, not only does destruction of nature show disrespect for God, hello, and the environment God created, it shows a lack of concern for the consequences environmental destruction has on humanity in the current and future generations. As the data continues to come in, we're beginning to see more and clearly the real connections between environmental pollution and degradation and worsening health and livelihood, both at local and global level. So here's again some statistics. We've got to have the harsh realities in order to move us into that action. And he says... Increasingly, water pollution in the United States has made many of our freshwater and marine fish toxic to children and pregnant women due to harmful levels of chemicals such as mercury and dioxin, with those statistics from the EPA. Air pollution causes over 64,000 premature deaths annually in America alone. The tremendous destruction of life and property during storms and flooding in places such as India and the Gulf Coast of the U.S. was greatly increased due to removal of coastal forest habitats and other natural barriers. In other countries outside the United States with little ability to regulate and enforce pollution and environmental laws, things are often much worse. And yet the U.S. is not without uh, some blame for these problems as well. Many of our consumer choices contribute to health concerns in other countries. For instance, our demand for low-cost paper and wood products increases deforestation in countries across South America. It pollutes water sources, contributes to species extinction, and forces poor families to move off land they've been living on but cannot afford to buy. Until we recognize how our waste, destruction, and overconsumption of natural resources affects others and do something to change, this is what Micah Bennett says, we cannot fulfill the second great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. Woo! Whatever we do to one of the least of these, we do to Christ. 
Do you see that? I mean, a direct connection between the environment and our love of our neighbor. If my disregard for the environment keeps causing harm and it causes harm to people in another country and causes someone to have to move out of their home and they can't afford to be in another place, and if it's causing literal death in families because of the poisons in our water, then I am not loving my neighbor. My spiritual covenanted relationship with all of creation. Got it? The plastic water bottle is simply a symbol for us today as we consider recycling and reusing and reducing. However, as we look at the water itself, we have to think of some things through green eyes as well and this impact on our neighbor and how our, in, our actions and lack of action impact others. Safe drinking water is a big issue on our planet, yes? There's currently enough water on Earth to sustain life, but the water is not distributed equally, and the clean water is not distributed equally, right? There's an inherent conflict of interest between the needs of poor nations and private water companies. Hear this, church. Often people cannot afford the new, clean, privatized water that is available, so they choose to return to the streams of free water that contain waterborne diseases such as cholera. What do you do if your life requires water and you can't afford to buy it? What do you do? Whenever clean water isn't available, there's conflict. Conflicts over quantity, over management, and sustainable use. And this creates water rivals. Reverend Dr. James Forbes Jr. writes, While we associate war with differences based on religion and politics, war based on sharing a scarce resource such as water is real. It is said that if the 20th century brought oil wars, the 21st century will bring water wars. Wow. Where are we, church? Because water is essential in maintaining the balance of the ecosystem, life itself, we must come face to face with the issues dealing with our water. Quality, access, distribution, sustainable use, rights to water. It's easy for us here to take the water we use to flush a toilet or to shower or to run the dishwasher or the washing machine, to take that for granted. It's very clear we take much of our water for granted when we see sprinkler systems running in rainstorms. We are not thinking True or true. And again, if I'm speaking to the choir, then choir, you need to sing to your friends and neighbors. Amen? Are you concerned about the quality of your drinking water? How concerned are you about the quality of your neighbor's drinking water? Your neighbor across the world. Are you concerned about the source of your water? where it's coming from, where it will come from. Lots of debates in North Texas right now about where water will come from, where the pipelines will go, and who will suffer if some pipelines get directed to Dallas, what other areas will be short water. Are you listening to those debates? Are you aware? If we would take responsibility for and care for the pollution on the water, the air, and the land, it would go a long way to cleaning up our water sources, wouldn't it? It's a monumental task, absolutely. But every small positive action helps. You can make a difference. Don't believe the lie that you can't make a difference. Every small action makes a difference. Will you be part of the problem or part of the solution? That's it. God gave us responsibility for the earth. Have we abandoned our God-given responsibility? Mm. Are we willing to see with green eyes, to see creation as intended by God? To see and be part of co-creating a sustainable environment. I came across this article by Kelly Mahoney on a Christian teen site entitled, Why Going Green is Christian. And so she's writing to teens in particular. She says, okay, so being a steward over God's creation sounds great and uh, responsible, right? Well, deciding to be more environmentally free, uh, friendly is the easy part. Doing it becomes harder. <laughs> going green means Keeping yourself educated on what does 
and does not do damage to the environment. It can also mean spending a little more money or giving up experiences. There's some simple ways to go green, but Christian teens, I say all of us, have to be prepared to give up some things that do real damage to the earth. It's not easy giving up those old habits, so just take one step at a time. Amen? Start with the small things like putting your cans and bottles in a recycling bin or taking a shorter shower. And then move on to bigger things like buying organic and locally grown products. Eventually becoming environmentally friendly won't be a big deal. It'll be the natural thing for you to take care of God's environments. So what can we do? We've been talking and identifying all the problems. What can we do? You know some of the things. It's about bringing it from back here back into the consciousness again. Today, we've talked about recycling, recycling a plastic bottle. It's only a small part of the solution. However, it is something you can do. Make a commitment to not throw another plastic bottle in a trash can. Let me see a sign of hands. I will not throw a bottle in a trash can. What will you do with it? Well, you might have to put it in a bag or put it in your car and take it back home with you to be able to put it in recycling when you get home, right? Choose to reuse a reusable bottle or a reusable hot or cold cup. It's a small action and it can make a difference. Individually, at home or at work or in the community, we have a choice. In the workplace, ask for more recycling units, right? It's, it's scriptural. It really is. See, scripture says, see, I set before you life or death. Shoes. Isn't that, isn't that scripture? Didn't Jesus say, oh, I wish you were hot or cold, but you are lukewarm, so I spit you out. <laughs> Don't do it halfway, because the halfway is not working. Make that commitment. Choose to recycle wherever you are, whether it's convenient or not. Amen? Amen. Uh, I'm asking, too, for people to volunteer to be on a green team for the church to help our church be more environmentally conscious, for us to set a better example. We need better recycling bins here, more visible, accessible for you all. We need help from doing that and greater modeling for us to one another and as a community. We need people that will help us organize folks to pick up the trash outside this building and in the flood control here. You want to talk about stuff that gets down to the rivers and streams? Check that flood control there. You know, we have an alternative high school right across the street. A lot of those kids come and smoke underneath the bridge and throw all their trash. We could have a relationship with them. Will you help me? We could help clean it up. Will you help me? We can be more aware and conscious, right? We can be more informed. We can choose to be more informed. That's where it begins, amen? We can purchase those products that use less packaging or recyclable, we can begin to buy local and buy organic to reduce pesticide residue in our foods and in our bodies. We can understand environmental consciousness as part of our spiritual stewardship, as part of our discipleship, and really live into my spiritual covenanted relationship with all of creation. Each one of us can respect, reduce, refuse, reuse, and recycle. We can see the world that God created and the world around us with green eyes. Amen.